Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, which, as you know, is a program of the MIT Alumni Association. Uh, my name is Nate Nickerson. I'm the Vice President for Communications at MIT. Uh, and I'll serve as the moderator of today's discussion, which will go from now until 12.45, which is 45 minutes from now. So uh, alumni, if you wish to ask a question, uh, just enter your first name and your location and the question uh, in the form that's on your screen right now, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, so our guest today, as you know, is Assistant Professor Feng Zheng. For those of you who are not familiar with his work, and I'm talking to both of you, uh, Professor Zhang is an assistant professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences uh, and a core member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Harvard, his graduate work at Stanford, and here he is at MIT. Um, he is well known for his pioneering work in genome editing, um, and he is also widely recognized for his contributions to the emerging field of optogenetics. Uh, in the last three years alone, um, Professor Zhang has been honored with many awards from his peers uh, in the field of biology, neuroscience, and medicine. Um, reactions to his work have been um, uh, intense in the press. I'll be uh, referring in a moment uh, to a very good piece in The New Yorker uh, about Professor Zhang. Um, and, uh, and I think we have the opportunity today to truly understand his work. So um, before I let Professor Zhang give us a little intro, let me explain some of the things I hope we do today. I hope we'll get a very good uh, understanding from Professor Zhang about what CRISPR is, uh, how it came to be, uh, what its relative significance is, and perhaps where it's going to be heading. I also hope we'll get uh, a good sense of Professor Zhang's background uh, and a little bit of insight into how he thinks. So, Professor Zhang, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so, um, if you wouldn't mind, I think you have a few slides uh, prepared, mm -hmm. uh, just walking uh, folks through uh, your work and through the sure. basics of CRISPR, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, good afternoon. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. And so one of the things that uh, really motivates us is to understand how the brain functions. And so the brain is one of the, the most complicated organs in our entire body. And so uh, as you can imagine, if something goes wrong, um, a large number of uh, diseases can, can uh, come as a result. Here is just a short list of uh, diseases that affect the brain. What is in common um, about them is that we don't really understand um, either um, the, the full mechanism or have treatments uh, for, for um, any of these diseases. And so the work of many laboratories over the past several decades have started to highlight the important contribution of the genetics and also the epigenetic uh, in, in the brain function. And so in order to understand that, uh, we need better tools uh, to be able to dissect um, the complexity of the brain. And so we have been taking approach of developing uh, molecular tools uh, to help us um, dissect the different aspects of brain function. Uh, we could either be looking at uh, the signaling that goes on in the brain uh, between different cells. Uh, so that was done by uh, developing tools called optogenetics, uh, which allow us to use uh, light uh, or laser flashes to be able to control the uh, patterns of activity that one cell signals to, to another cell. And then beyond the signaling, uh, we've also been uh, uh, focus on developing genome engineering technologies uh, to be able to alter the DNA sequences inside the neurons so that we can try to understand uh, what is the function um, of specific genetic uh, mutations or genetic differences uh, in the context of disease. And <clears throat> so together, uh, using these approaches, uh, we are hoping that we can uh, use it to uncover um, new mechanisms new uh, therapeutic targets that we can develop a drug for, and then be able to uh, treat um, uh, diseases of the brain. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we have been uh, developing 
uh, to do uh, DNA or genome editing uh, is from a bacterial immune system called CRISPR-Cas. Um, the bacterial cells very much like, like us. Uh, in nature, they are often invaded by viruses or other kinds of infectious uh, agents. And so we have an immune system in our body to be able to defend, uh, defend ourselves against bacteria and against uh, viruses. And the way our immune system works is through um, antibodies, which are proteins that serve to remember uh, previous infections. And, and when that virus infects us again, uh, it will mount an immune response and then uh, destroy the, the invading bacteria or virus. In bacterial cells, um, there's also an immune system. And this immune system uses RNA sequences to recognize the DNA of invading uh, viruses. And so RNA and DNA, they share the, a, a very similar code. And so the RNA can try to uh, match or pair with the DNA. And so this immune system in the bacterial cell, CRISPR-Cas, um, if this RNA um, pairs up with the invading DNA from the virus, uh, or DNA from the invading virus, uh, then the CRISPR-Cas system will destroy the incoming uh, DNA. And so this is a very powerful system. And what we have been uh, working on uh, is to harness some of the machineries, uh, enzymes or proteins from the CRISPR system and putting them into uh, mammals, uh, human cells or, or animal models, and be able to edit the DNA sequence so that you can make a cut in the DNA and, uh, and change it to um, sequences that you want to study or to um, repair disease-causing mutations and reverting them uh, back into a wild-type uh, sequence. And so um, the strategy that we have been taking uh, has been a three-pronged strategy uh, to develop the system. Uh, the first prong is, is we need to better understand the basic biology of the CRISPR system so that we can uh, figure out how we can best harness uh, these tools. And then the second is to develop applications, uh, test it in real world applications and see how well does the CRISPR system that we harness work? And how can we develop it so that researchers can use it to study anywhere from plant biology to, uh, to microbiology, uh, all the way to neurological and also psychiatric diseases. And then the third um, prong, which is just as important, is how do we uh, make sure that the reagent uh, is open and, and available, and all the know-how uh, is easily uh, accessible for researchers around the world who want to use this to study um, biology. And so we have also been uh, trying to make resources uh, available to, to the broader community. So um, broadly speaking, there are a lot of applications for the CRISPR-Cas or genome editing uh, technology. Uh, we can use it as a research tool uh, so, for example, we can use it to build uh, animal models. You can take a mouse or take a human cell and put in the specific genetic uh, mutation that you want to study, and then we can use that to test the function and try to discover um, mechanisms of disease. Uh, but beyond um, using it as a research tool, uh, you can also use this um, in the area of biotechnology. Uh, imagine using um, CRISPR-Cas to uh, introduce in specific um, variants or specific traits in plants to make them drought resistant or to provide higher yield, um, or uh, be able to engineer uh, microorganisms to be able to um, produce uh, higher levels of biofuel so that we can solve the energy crisis and so forth. And then the third, um, which is also very exciting, uh, is in the long run, uh, we may be able to develop CRISPR-Cas into a therapeutic uh, technology. So rather than using using it to research uh, biology, we may be able to uh, put CRISPR-Cas into the cells of a, of a, a disease-affected uh, organ and be able to fix uh, the specific mutations that may be underlying the disease. For example, um, hopefully we might be able to take uh, blood stem cells from someone who has uh, sickle cell disease, repair the mutation, and then put those stem cells back into the patient and therefore um, treat uh, sickle cell disease uh, using genome editing. And so these are just some of the um, applications, and of course there are, there are many more applications, and, uh, and, and I'm really uh, delighted to be here today uh, to tell you more about um, the, the CRISPR-Cas uh, technology. Excellent. So, uh, Professor Zhang, um, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question, and I say to you out there that the, um, 
Um, the floor is sort of now yours, as it were, so send in any questions you have and we'll get to those. Um, Professor Zhang, I wonder if you can walk us through um, the basics of what um, approach, uh, and maybe there are, are, are more than one, but mm -hmm. what approach does CRISPR follow on in, in, in the editing of the genome? Um, so the way that, um, <clears throat> the way we edit the genome uh, is by, <clears throat> so, so think about this. So uh, if you are, the genome is, is a long um, string of DNA. And in the human genome, there are uh, three billion letters, and there are four letters in the genome, so A, T, G, and C. Um, for a mutation uh, in the genome, it could be any of the three billion letters. So imagine if you are trying to uh, type, a, type a document uh, in Microsoft Word, and you made a typo. So after you print it out, you read it on paper, and you fig figured out that there is a specific typo uh, in, in this document on page 37 out of uh, 5,000 pages. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so once you go back to your computer, how do you go about fixing that typo? Well, one way to do it is to type in that sentence um, that contains the typo into the search function so that the program uh, can take the cursor and place it in where that uh, typo is. Once the cursor is there, then you can uh, delete or insert and basically re repair the the word and, and make it make the, the meaning uh, restored. <clears throat> the way that we do about ge uh, the, the way we go about doing genome editing is we um, use CRISPR Cas, which is like the search function uh, inside of uh, Microsoft Word. You give it a string of RNA, and this RNA is designed based on the sequence in the DNA uh, that contains the mutation, mm -hmm. and so. Cas9, uh, or CPF1, <coughs> is the enzyme, and it will work with this RNA search string. And it will take the RNA search string along, and the enzyme will go in <coughs> and, and go into the genome and be able to uh, match uh, along the genome and, and find where it, it's perfectly matching. When that happens, then the Cas9 enzyme uh, will make a cut in the DNA. So it will literally, uh, like a scissors, make a cut. That cut is the cursor. Mm -hmm. So wherever you mm -hmm. cut, um, you can then stimulate the repair process. Mm -hmm. And, so, and so, so think of CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR-CPF1 as a way of using RNA as a search string to direct the scissors to the mutation site in the genome uh, and allow you to make a, a double-stranded break to place the cursor there uh, to start editing. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, um, so we have a question from Michael in Houston. Uh, who asks, um, do you have more faith in the CRISPR method than in Talon or uh, ZFN uh, methods? Um, why or why not? And perhaps as part of answering that question, sure. can you can give a little definition for us. Sure. So, um, so thank you very much for the question. Um, this is a very, very, very good question. So CRISPR um, is um, probably the latest generation of genome editing technology. And before CRISPR, there have been, there have been other uh, genome editing technologies uh, developed as well. And so one of the technology is called um, TALON. It stands for Transcription Activator-like uh, Effector Nuclease, which, which is basically an enzyme that's harnessed from a different type of microbe uh, to be able to also uh, find specific sequences uh, in the genome mm -hmm. and, and make that cut to place the cursor there. Um, before Talon, there's another technology called ZFN, and then before ZFN, there's another technology called meganuclease. And so these are different iterations of the technology. Uh, you can think of them as um, uh, the rotary dial phone to, to, a, to a digital phone, uh, to a cell phone, to a smartphone, and so forth. The difference between CRISPR and also all of the earlier technology is that it's much, much easier to reprogram. So, if you want to find a specific sequence in the genome, all you have to do is to give it a search string to, mm -hmm. to find where it is. In contrast, for Talon or for uh, ZFN or for meganuclease, that search string is encoded in the hardware uh, of the computer. So mm -hmm. you imagine you have to build a new computer mm -hmm. uh, to be able to search for a new mm -hmm. typo. That's enormously complicated and it's much slower. Mm -hmm. So because of that, CRISPR is much easier, and that's part of the reason why CRISPR has been so rapidly adapted mm -hmm. um, around the world to do um, both research and also for development of many applications. Mm -hmm. Now, one important um, consideration for any genome editing technology uh, is the specificity and also the, the efficiency of the system. 
Um, when you compare CRISPR with the other systems, um, the CRISPR system is very robust. So uh, if you wanted to cut somewhere, it will make the cut. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so from that perspective, um, it's better than these other technologies because it's more efficient. Um, in terms of specificity, um, there has been a lot of work going on to make CRISPR um, more efficient, uh, more more specific. Uh, the f very first generation of the CRISPR system uh, that we reported a couple of years ago um, is known to make off-target cuts. Mm -hmm. So um, for sequences in the genome that are highly similar but not perfectly matching, uh, they can also get modified. Um, but many groups have been working on developing new, uh, improved versions of CRISPR. And so uh, just last week, we had published a paper um, describing a way of engineering the Cas9 enzyme to make it uh, much, much more specific than before. And so, so with these new improvements, uh, they are as good, uh, if not better, than, than the other technologies. And of course, uh, there's many, many more um, uh, projects that are going on uh, to make the system even more um, powerful and specific. And so I think um, as, as these developments happen, um, uh, CRISPR will really become a, a very uh, resilient and, and a precise tool. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you. So um, we have another question. This is from Don in Pittsburgh, uh, who asks whether you foresee uh, any possible applications to learning more precise detail about the specific mechanism of initiation of disease, such as Alzheimer's or any other uh, uh, disease that manifests in the brain? Yeah, um, so thank you for the question. The uh, CRISPR technology is, is a very powerful tool uh, for studying uh, the effect of uh, genes or specific genetic mutations uh, or variations uh, in, in the DNA of a cell. Mm -hmm. And so um, it can certainly be used as a tool to discover uh, what mutations uh, exacerbate uh, the risk for disease or what mutations cause the development of some disease. So we can take the Alzheimer uh, disease uh, as an example. Uh, we know that there are certain mutations or certain uh, genetic differences that um, increase the risk for developing a dementia or Alzheimer's. And, and so even when, the, when someone has a mutation uh, that increases the risk, it doesn't mean that person will, um, uh, with 100% probability, develop uh, the disease. Mm -hmm. And the other, so there are other contributors um, that take a, dis a risk probability and turn it into a certainty. And so we can use CRISPR as a way of discovering what are these other factors uh, that, um, that cooperate with the mm -hmm. disease risk and then, and then uh, eventually result in the disease. So for example, um, you can use CRISPR to uh, systematically uh, inactivate or activate uh, every single gene uh, in the genome, either individually or in, um, in combinations, and see what are the combinations or individual changes in the cell uh, that will uh, make a, a cellular model of Alzheimer's disease um, exhibit signs of um, uh, degeneration or, or what will cause those neurons um, uh, to die. And, uh, and, and by identifying these combinations of factors, um, then we can start to unravel um, the, the mechanism for how the disease is initiated or, or how it progresses uh, through the, the life of the cell. Great, so I want to, I'm sure that with some of the questions that come in, we'll probably return to CRISPR. Um, I want to swivel away from that for just a second mm -hmm. uh, to ask the following. So if we, if we think about the questions about CRISPR as being about uh, a, a tool, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in getting a little bit from you about your thought about the brain itself, which you're, in, in, this, in, in, in this case, applying the tool to. Mm -hmm. So, in the, um, so um, I would say to folks out there that if you haven't read uh, the Michael Spector piece in The New Yorker from, uh, uh, from one of the mid-November issues, uh, I encourage you to read it. Um, I'm going to read back a quote to you, uh, Professor Zhang. Um, uh, and then ask you a kind of a question from that. So um, one of the things you say in the piece uh, is that, um, and I quote, the brain is still the place in the universe with the most unanswered questions. So as you take this tool, which as you've described, is not only um, uh, sort of stunning in its power, but also being rapidly developed kind of mm -hmm. live, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
if, if, you, if, if you don't mind, can you talk with us about a couple of these grand questions about the brain that you're interested in using this emerging technology to, to begin to answer? What, what mm -hmm. do you think about when you think about the brain? Sure. Um, so I, I became very interested uh, in, in studying the brain um, because uh, I realized there are a lot of diseases um, in the brain uh, that affect the brain uh, that we don't just don't have a good understanding. Um, so um, specifically, uh, diseases that affect um, uh, our uh, or psychiatric diseases that affect our our, our basic functions as human beings mm -hmm. uh, are some of the diseases that we really just don't have a good way of understanding. Now, um, for many other diseases, uh, we can already start to diagnose them uh, based on mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, if we uh, take, uh, if we look at cancer, we can already start to figure out what type of cancer it is, what are the genetic mutations um, that are found in these tumor cells, and then be able to develop treatments based on that mechanistic understanding. Mm -hmm. For neurological psychiatric diseases, uh, we're still very, very much at the, the early stage of that. Mm -hmm. um, for diagnosis of um, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or major depression, they're often just based on phenotype. Mm -hmm. It's not based on um, understanding or, 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 or diagnostics of specific molecular mechanisms uh, in these patients. So indeed, um, diseases like major depression or uh, schizophrenia or autism or, uh, or bipolar, uh, they are uh, very much spectrum disorders. They are probably, um, the, the many, the, there are probably many different subtypes within each one of these um, diagnosis categories. Just like when you say cancer, um, there are really many different forms of cancer. And so one of the, the problems there is then to figure out um, what are the, the mechanisms underlying these diseases um, that will allow us to, to have a more accurate and, and more mechanistic based diagnosis so that we can better um, figure out what treatments to apply for the part particular uh, disease. Right now, um, if an antidepressant was to be uh, prescribed, um, the psychiatrist may start with one antidepressant and say, let's try this for a number of weeks and see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll increase the dose. And if the increased dosage doesn't work, we'll switch to a different drug. So it's entirely based on <coughs> um, experimental trial and error rather than based on some understanding or insight into disease and then picking the right uh, treatment. So I think that's one of the major um, challenges facing the, the diagnosis and also the treatment of uh, psychiatric, psychiatric diseases. The same challenge also applies to many other uh, neurological diseases too. Um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, so forth. Um, we know there are genetic bases um, from, from uh, familial um, uh, disease patients who have um, uh, single mutations that, that cause the disease. But then also um, the vast majority of patients uh, we have no idea what causes uh, the disease or, or how do we predict that something will happen uh, in these patients. And so under, um, and understanding those uh, molecular mechanisms uh, that lead to, to, to those diseases is also uh, one of the really important uh, challenges. And so um, we thought we have to start somewhere and, uh, and maybe um, uh, because there are so many genes and so many um, genetic differences that are uh, involved in, in these diseases, uh, we need better tools to be able to um, take apart these different um, genes and genetic mutations. And, and that's what got us started uh, to work on genome editing because uh, being able to easily, cheaply, and also very rapidly um, introduce mutations that, that will make it uh, possible to uh, start to interrogate the, the scale of this, uh, this problem. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so we do have a couple more questions that have come mm -hmm. in. I'll go to those and I'll, I'll come back and ask you a little bit about uh, your, uh, your uh, personal story. Mm -hmm. But Robert in LA asks the following. Um, how do you know the target sequence in the genome for whatever you're trying to do? And please, uh, he asks to, uh, to you to give examples for non-biologists, if you will. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. So, um, so the, the human genome uh, is composed of uh, DNA. And, and DNA is composed of um, just four letters, um, that's A, T, G, and C. And so the human genome is, th a, it's a, it's a, it's a long string of, four billion, uh, of three billion letters, and there are just four types of letters in this uh, long string. 
And so if you were to figure out a particular uh, sequence that you want to uh, target, um, we can go to the, the already existing uh, human genome. So the human genome has been sequenced, and this is one of the really important advances in biology mm -hmm. in, the, in the recent decade. With this um, human genome, with the complete human genome sequence, um, it gives us um, a reference point for uh, what the sequence may be. And so we'll go into a computer and, uh, and we'll open up this three billion uh, letter long um, document and then we'll go to the right gene that we want to study or design a CRISPR for and then we'll copy the sequence from there and then use that to, to make, a, make a small RNA. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a, a question from Kip in Portland, Maine, uh, who asks, um, what role should industry play in developing CRISPR research? Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, uh, what percentage of research using the method, uh, being CRISPR, is happening now at universities versus companies? Um, that, that is a very uh, good question. And I think, um, so CRISPR is already being um, both developed and also deployed um, in academia and in industry, and, and quite broadly uh, in both academia and also industry. Uh, there are researchers, um, from many universities. I think anybody in biology who is doing anything with DNA uh, is now probably using some form of the CRISPR technology uh, to, uh, in their uh, applications. They use it to generate animal models, or they use it to uh, manipulate their cells, um, or they use it to, to uh, conduct genetic screens to find new gene uh, function. Um, and, and this is, um, this is in, in animal biology, in molecular biology, in plant biology, basically anywhere uh, where, where people are working on uh, uh, using these molecular tools. Um, in industry, uh, it's, it's very much the same. Um, I think all of the major pharmaceutical companies are already using CRISPR as a tool uh, in their uh, research and development um, laboratories. They're using it uh, either for uh, discovery of new drug targets or for validation of drug targets, and, um, and, and also um, even outside of that, um, in, uh, in, in, some, uh, in, in many educational uh, settings, I think people are already uh, using CRISPR as well uh, to just learn how to uh, manipulate uh, the genome of, of different organisms. So that's all for using uh, CRISPR as, uh, as application tools. Um, there are also many laboratories, both in academia and also industry, uh, that are developing the CRISPR uh, technology. And, and so in academia, there are laboratories uh, like mine, but also many other laboratories uh, that are working on developing and, and improving the CRISPR technology. Um, in industry, uh, there's also quite a bit of activity. Um, depending on the, uh, the, the function of the company, um, there are, for example, uh, several companies that have been uh, established in the past couple of years uh, focused on developing CRISPR into a therapeutic uh, drug. And so they are developing uh, with that very specific uh, purpose in mind to make CRISPR uh, more specific, more powerful, and, and make it possible so that they can be delivered uh, into, into a patient. But then uh, plant biology companies um, are, are probably developing CRISPR uh, for application in, in different uh, crop species. There are also uh, folks who are developing CRISPR for engineering livestock. Um, or using it to engineer uh, microorganisms for biofuels. Um, so, so it's a very exciting time uh, for genome editing because um, there, are, there are really many, many laboratories, uh, both in academia and, and in industry, and oftentimes they work um, in a collaborative fashion uh, to advance the technology. Great. Um, so a very interesting technical question comes from Erica in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, for small deletions made by CRISPR, mm -hmm. is there the possibility of kind of correction back to the original sequence through recombination? Yes. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I, I did a poor job of explaining um, the, the correction part. So the way that CRISPR works is, is it makes a cut in the DNA. And that cut is, uh, you can think of it as a cursor in Microsoft Word. So once you make a cut, um, CRISPR, this cut will um, engage um, proteins or machineries that are already present in, in the cell uh, to facilitate the, the, uh, the change. 
So if you don't provide anything in addition to the CRISPR system, uh, that cut will result in either a random insertion or a random deletion. And that's very powerful for inactivating or deleting something from the genome. But you can also uh, provide a repair template at the same time as when you put in the CRISPR system. And this template will work with a different set of machinery in the cell uh, to allow recombination of a very specific sequence uh, into the DNA uh, to then allow correction or, or precise alteration of a sequence. So for example, if, if, um, um, if ultimately we want to treat uh, CC fibrosis and uh, we want to correct uh, the, the Delta 506 mutation, then one thing to do is to introduce both the CRISPR reagent to make a cut in where that mutation uh, exists in the cell, but then also at the same time provide a repair template, uh, which is a piece of DNA that has the, the correct sequence, and the, and the machinery in the cell will use that new template DNA to then swap in uh, or recombine in uh, the, the, the desired sequence. Great. So um, we have a couple of uh, very good questions that I, I will ask, uh, but let me interrupt these questions to ask you, mm -hmm. if there was, if, if we kind of go back to your childhood or to your young adulthood, um, w was there a, um, anything kind of memorable uh, in terms of your experience that got you very interested either in science generally or in um, a path that led you here? Um, sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think all along uh, my my, my um, childhood and also my, my training, um, I have been very fortunate to have very fantastic mentors. Um, uh, I grew up in, in a household of uh, engineers, so uh, I was naturally exposed to a lot mm -hmm. of the scientific, technical things. Um, and then that got me a very interesting technology, but mostly in the computer uh, area. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I moved to Des Moines, Iowa um, from China, um, my middle school uh, had a Saturday program on uh, uh, just telling kids about different things going on, and one of the classes was molecular biology. And so I went to that class, and the teacher there uh, really kind of opened up my mind in terms of uh, thinking about biology. Mm -hmm. Because before then, I thought biology was just about uh, memorizing things and dissecting frogs and labeling anatomical parts. Um, and working in a smelly room. Uh, but but the, the, the enrichment class um, really, uh, they showed us how to extract DNA from strawberries, uh, they showed us the movie Jurassic Park, and all of that um, uh, just uh, made me become extremely fascinated about molecular biology. It's something that you can possibly um, use rational um, thinking to be able to engineer or, or to, to do something useful. Um, and then in high school, I had a, a really phenomenal opportunity to then work in a, uh, in a gene therapy lab. And there, again, I had a fantastic mentor. His name is John Levy. And, uh, and he um, taught me all sorts of uh, knowledge about uh, biology and molecular biology. Um, much of that I still use today. And then in college and in graduate school, um, I then again worked with fantastic mentors. My PhD advisor, Carl Dyseroth, who's at Stanford, uh, was, was uh, both a role model as well as someone who really taught me how to uh, think about uh, taking on important problems and, and, uh, and developing solutions for them um, uh, through a very rational, systematic approach. And, and even now, uh, being at MIT with all the colleagues and, and uh, collaborators, um, it's just been a fantastic learning experience all, all throughout, and, um, and I think I feel very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so back to questions, and uh, Ian from Golden, Colorado asks a big one and a good one. Um, so he asks, uh, he says, look, CRISPR is being both hailed and assailed, mm -hmm. um, and we have seen that in the press. Um, so he asks, how are bioethicists keeping up with the potential uses and abuses of this technology. I know that there was a recent meeting about all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, a, this is a very important question. So CRISPR is a powerful technology, um, but um, <coughs> depends on how you use the technology, uh, there, there can be, um, there can be uh, both positive as well as the negative effects. And so indeed, uh, the question of what is the, the best way and the most thoughtful and prudent way of using technology has been very much um, under uh, debate and consideration. So for example, um, uh, a lot of this has been covered uh, in, in newspaper articles. And, and then just a couple of weeks ago, um, um, I was at an um, international summit 
um, co-hosted by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, um, the U.K. Royal Society, and also the Chinese Academy of Science. And, and it was the first gathering, uh, the first international gathering, where experts, uh, both the scientists as well as uh, bioethics um, uh, experts, have come together to, to begin a dialogue about uh, how to think about applying this technology. And so, um, so these conversations are very important. Um, the, the summit was, was very, uh, very helpful and very, very useful um, as it uh, started to, to converge everybody so that we know what are the, the points to think about. And also, uh, it provided a very useful and important guidance for, for how to uh, use the technology. These kinds of considerations are, are ongoing. Um, and in fact, there, there's a very specific working group um, from this summit uh, that is now uh, in the process of generating a, a, a scientific uh, description and also a report um, that, um, that advises what is the, the uh, best path forward. And, uh, and so, so I think those are all very important activities uh, that, will, that will help us um, uh, use this uh, very responsibly. Great, okay, a couple other good ones. Uh, so Alan in Plainfield, Vermont, um, uh, has this. Uh, he says, in, in a disease like ataxia, a genetic error, say 40 repeats of code instead of 20, is a dominant error that causes brain problems. Mm -hmm. Would we expect CRISPR to be able to impact every cell in a grown person and help with a cure? He says that what what's amazes him is a prospect that, um, that this technology can work to change every cell. So I know there's a lot in there, but I wonder yeah. what you make of that. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. So, so, so genetic diseases are caused by genetic mutations that uh, are either inherited from our parents um, or uh, it somehow uh, happened um, either during development or, or, or once we became adult and, and uh, DNA inside our cells are mutated. A disease like ataxia could be an inherit inherited disorder, so that really means every single cell in our body uh, carries that mutation in, in the DNA. But just because every cell carries the mutation doesn't mean that mutation is active in every single cell. Mm -hmm. um, our genome is the same in every single cell, but we have different kinds of cells in the body. We have brain cells, we have skin cells, and we have liver cells, and we have muscle. These cells are different because they um, express a different subset of genes. So not every cell um, or any cell expresses every single gene in the genome. And so when we are thinking about a disease mutation, um, it's really important to, to um, make sure uh, we understand um, what are the cells that express this uh, mutated gene. So for example, um, one form of uh, ataxia called spinocerebellar ataxia uh, will only will, will have a gene that carries a mutation that is predominantly affecting uh, cells in, in the cerebellum. And in that case, um, the, the need, so we, we will not need to correct every single cell in the body because the vast majority of cells um, is, is, is not affected by the mutation. And we just have to make sure uh, we go into the relevant cells and make the, the change. Even then, um, it may not be critical that we change every single cell uh, in the affected tissue. Uh, of course, it depends on the disease, um, but it's likely that even repairing a, a large fraction um, of cells, uh, say somewhere between 30% um, to 70% of cells, uh, will already provide a very significant um, uh, therapeutic uh, relief. Great. Okay, we have a really uh, great question from Sonia in Cambridge. This is sort of along the lines of light, uh, sort of day in the life of Feng Zheng. Um, so she asks, "What a day? Uh, what a, a lab using uh, CRISPR looks like?" And as part of that, she asks, "How much time do you spend in code versus at a microscope?" And and are mathematicians at work in such a lab also? Sure. Um, so so. Um CRISPR is being used in, in many laboratories around the world now. And, uh, and, and most of those labs, or all of those labs, uh, have um, basic setup for doing molecular biology. And so, so this would be a, if you imagine if you walk into the lab space, you will see uh, benches. And, and on the benches, there will be um, fairly standard laboratory equipments, uh, like a centrifuge, or a, a scale, or 
a water bath where um, there's water in there maintained at a specific temperature. Uh, and then there will be PCR machines. And then to uh, manipulate cells, um, uh, th imagine in the room there are also incubators. And in, inside the incubator, uh, which are often maintained at 37 degrees, so our, our body temperature, uh, there are petri dishes uh, that are filled with uh, different kinds of fluid. And the fluid are the nutrients uh, that keep the cells in those petri dishes alive. And, uh, and there are also microscopes where you can uh, visualize these, cell, uh, these cells uh, to see what are the effects of the modification. And, uh, and so, so these are fairly standard um, uh, molecular biology, cell biology, uh, set up uh, within the, the laboratory. And then there will also be um, computers. Um, and and, and uh, you asked whether or not mathematicians are working on it. Um, uh, we, 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 we don't use a lot of very, um, very advanced um, theoretical math, but there is quite a bit of um, computation programming uh, involved to be able to analyze the result. Uh, because oftentimes the data that we collect uh, is, is quite massive. And, uh, and, and being able to write computer programs, um, uh, be able to um, program specific algorithms to analyze the data, uh, that is something that, that is also uh, very routine. Great. Um, we have uh, five minutes of time for a couple more questions. Uh, so this comes from Ali in Boston who asks, is CRISPR editing only performed in vitro in cells or can it also be, form be performed in vivo? Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a good, good, good question. So CRISPR really can be used uh, in both in vivo and also uh, in vitro uh, set up, uh, settings. Uh, for in vitro, um, you can modify cells in petri dishes. And for in vivo, uh, we have developed um, uh, small uh, compact enzymes uh, that can be efficiently uh, introduced into the body of a mouse. And there are also uh, other researchers now uh, applying this into rats and, and also uh, other animal models. And, and it works well uh, in these animal models. And so, so that, um, uh, that, that uh, suggests that maybe uh, eventually we can develop it uh, for therapeutic delivery uh, into patients. Um, so I'll actually uh, 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 take the last question, uh, which will be sort of vague. Uh, uh -huh. But for the folks who work in your lab, for students you teach, um, mm -hmm. what, what is most interesting to them, most motivating to them, what keeps them um, really engaged in this work? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And, and I think um, the, the ability to, to manipulate the genome and also being able to use it to understand um, the mechanistic basis of disease uh, mm -hmm. is very much something that motivates all of us uh, to work on developing uh, this technology. And, uh, and as we develop the technology, um, we realize that uh, what, what we want to do is to be able to make any kind of change we want inside a cell so that we can study uh, these genetic effects and also be able to then go into a patient and, and remove uh, specific mutations so that we can treat disease. As we work toward developing and achieving these goals, uh, we, are, we, we learn about the challenges and, and the limitations of the existing systems. And that also uh, provides us with uh, with um, motivation for uh, how to make it uh, even more powerful to, to finally be able to uh, reach that goal. And, um, and, and it's really been very exciting. And, and also, um, uh, the entire community is all very engaged in, in developing technology. So working as a part of this energetic and, and um, uh, exciting field uh, is something that, that also provides a lot of um, momentum and energy. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, with regret, we have to stop there. But Professor Zhang, on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Um, I found it completely fascinating, and I know folks out there uh, must have also. So uh, to the alumni, I will say that if we didn't get to your question, we will, if you do submit it through the, uh, through the screen uh, in front of you, we will pass it on to Professor Zhang after the broadcast. And feel free to share other questions or comments on Twitter using the hashtag MITFaculty. You can also view an archive of past faculty forums online by visiting the Learn section of the Alumni Association website. Uh, please join us next month for another session of Faculty Forum Online. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.